One aspect of engineering, or at least mechanical engineering, that can be particularly daunting at first is engineering drawings. They are often a maze of lines and symbols that seem very confusing, and to say that they are always laid out in a readable manner would be a joke. In this video, I'm going to try and explain the layout and components of an engineering drawing, as well as demystify what's considered to be traditional dimensioning and tolerancing. In part two of this video, I will cover the ASME Y145 GDNT symbols, which is what most North Americans will be using. So, most engineering drawings should have five main things. A title block, or a vision table, a bomb, general notes, and views of the part or assembly. The title block will have information such as the name of the part, the part number, who made the drawing, who approved the drawing, the scale of the drawing, number of sheets, the revision number, the units of measurement, and sheet tolerance. The revision table will have information such as what changed in each revision and who made the changes. The bomb and assembly drawing is where you would indicate which part numbers are required for the assembly, and in a part drawing you may indicate the required material here. General notes are where you would put information such as your heat treating requirements, serialization requirements, or coatings. Finally, the part that's most confusing, the actual drawing views. On an assembly drawing, you will typically have a couple of views of a completed assembly and then some exploded views. These are not a replacement for the assembly instructions, they are more just to show you what goes into the assembly. On a part drawing, it's common practice to have an isometric view of the part at the top right of the first page and then different views of the part throughout the middle. For a very symmetric part, you may only have two views, however, as parts get more complex, you will start to see different views added. So the popular method is to give between two and six orthographic views of the part. If you were to draw an imaginary cube around the part, each view would be looking directly at that side. This gets more complicated, however, when there are relatively small features that need to be shown. If this is the case, a detail view can be added. A detail view is usually indicated by a rectangle or a circle with a capital letter connected to it by a leader. The view will then be scaled up so that the important features are visible. The view needs two things below it, the view letter and the scale that it's at. The detail view may or may not be connected to the original view by line to increase readability. Because orthographic views only show the outside of a part, and some parts have internal geometry, section views may be added. A section view in its most basic form is two arrows connected by a line. These arrows will each have a letter to label it, and the line is basically mimicking a cut line. If you were to cut apart at that line, the arrows would be telling you which direction to be looking at the part at. If multiple features along different planes are needed to be shown, you may see offset or angled views. You may also see section views that are off the drawing at an angle. This is typically to give a head-on view of a feature that is at a strange angle relative to the local coordinate system. If the drawing is something that is much longer than its profile, such as with pipes or stock metal forms, you may see a break view. All this is saying is that the form between these breaks has the same profile. Finally, you may see sections outlined with a dash box or traced with a dash line, also known as chain line. This is often attached with a note that indicates that something must happen to this area, such as hardening or peening. So now that we've covered what kind of views we can use, we can move on to the methods of traditional dimensioning. Length or distance can be indicated in a few ways, however the most common way is linear dimensions. Linear dimensions can be written in a few ways. The first is with extension lines which shows the distance between two features directly and these extension lines don't need to be perpendicular to the distance they're measuring. The next form is without extension lines. This is useful when you're trying to show the relative distance of multiple features from the same baseline which is zero in this format. Finally is tabular. This is used at times where having lines going to each feature would clutter the drawing too much or when lines would be so close together that it would be difficult to determine which feature is being referenced. Angles are typically quite straightforward. They'll typically be denoted by two extension lines and an angle between them. However, you also may see angles marked with a note. Round features are typically written using the diameter symbol, which is a circle with a diagonal line through it. The size of a diameter is then written after this. Radii are also sometimes used, however, they are typically reserved for features that aren't closed. These are a capital R followed by the dimension. Beside a diameter, there are a few symbols you may see. For a through hole, you will see the letters THRU. For a blind hole, you will typically see a depth symbol followed by the distance that the hole must go from the top surface. If nothing is specified, you may need to go to a section view, as the distance from the opposite surface may be more important. Because many holes are for fasteners, you often see counterbore holes. This will typically be shown on the line below the diameter as the counterbore symbol, the diameter of the counterbore, and then the depth of the counterbore. Sometimes a radius of the fillet is specified, however, I haven't seen this very often. 
Spot faces are another thing you may see, which is a counterbore symbol with SF on the inside of it. If a spot face has a depth beside it, it's essentially the same as a counterbore, and therefore, in my opinion, useless. Where it is useful is when no depth is specified. In this case, it means that you continue boring down until the diameter is fully machined. This is useful when you're trying to dimension on cast parts and you don't actually know what the surface is going to look like. The final common thing you may see with the hole is a countersunk callout, which is formatted by the symbol, the max diameter of the countersink, and the angle of the countersink. Many features that you may think are holes at first are actually threads, and these are denoted by a dashed line around the outside of the diameter. In a section view, you will see something similar. The callout for a tapped hole is typically the size of the thread, the depth at which fully formed threads are required, and then the size and depth of the pilot hole. Two more things that you may see on a drawing are surface finish callout or a weld symbol. These two don't need much explanation if you're just learning to read drawings. It's, as long as you know what they are, that's fine. However, if you're starting to create drawings and design parts, understanding how to use these symbols will become very important. These two symbols each require a video on their own. So with the traditional dimensioning out of the way, we can now talk about tolerancing. Because we live in an imperfect world, asking someone to machine a perfect 50 by 50 by 50 millimeter cube would be absolutely impossible. There's error in the machining, there's error in the measuring, and on top of that, materials grow and shrink depending on the temperature. For this reason, you need to give a range for the dimensions to fall within. The first is limit tolerancing, which is basically when you explicitly state the upper and lower bounds. A spin-off of this is when only one bound matters, in which case you may put the bound followed by either min or max. Next is symmetric tolerancing, which is when you have the nominal size of a feature followed by a plus or minus symbol and a tolerance band. This is saying that the feature can be between x minus y and x plus y. Bilateral tolerancing is when a tolerance band is not evenly distributed on either side of a nominal size. In this case, we can have plus minus, plus plus, or minus minus. A related form of this is unilateral tolerancing, which is when either the upper or the lower tolerance is zero. The final form of tolerancing is called fit tolerancing. This is probably the most confusing to people, especially when the fit tolerance doesn't include the actual numerical values. A fit tolerance will be in the form of the nominal size of the feature, followed by a letter, then a number. In the case of an external size, such as a diameter of a shaft, the letter will be a lowercase, and for an internal size, the letter will be an uppercase. Initially looking at fit tolerancing, it makes very little sense. However, it can be basically broken down into three main concepts. The letter controls the max material condition, or MMC. The number controls the width of the tolerance band. And the closer the letter is to the start of the alphabet, the less material you have. I'll start by explaining what max material condition means. Imagine you have a rod that's 10 millimeters plus or minus one millimeter diameter. If the rod is 11 millimeters diameter, it will have more material than a rod of the same length at nine millimeters diameter. Conversely, if a box has a hole that is 10 millimeters plus or minus one millimeter, the box will have more material if the hole has a nine millimeter diameter. If it's easier for you, you can think of it in terms of weight. A max material condition has more weight than a least material condition. With that out of the way, I'll explain the letters. If you see the letter H beside either a hole or a shaft, immediately you know the MMC of this feature is nominal size. For example, a 10 millimeter H6 shaft is 10 millimeters plus zero minus nine microns and a 10 millimeter H6 hole is 10 millimeters plus nine microns minus zero. Now the closer the letter is to the start of the alphabet, the lighter the part will be. Another example is a 10 millimeter A6 shaft will be 10 millimeters minus 2.8 minus 2.89, while a 10 millimeter A6 hole will be 10 millimeters plus 2.89 plus 2.8. Notice the symmetry in the tolerances? Now before you get too excited and start that the symmetry starts making sense, I'll give one more example. A 10 millimeter Z6 shaft will be 10 millimeters plus 51 microns plus 42 microns, while a 10 millimeter Z6 hole is 10 millimeters minus 39 microns minus 48 microns. I'd put money on you thinking that they would always be mirrored, but funny enough, they're only mirrored from A to JS. Then the mirrored tolerances end. However, a different pattern is maintained. 51 minus 42 is 9, 48 minus 38 is 9, and 289 minus 280 is 9. Now you understand what the number does. The number controls the size of the tolerance band. If you'd like to prove this to yourself or prove me wrong, and I'd encourage you to, uh, I'd recommend downloading the Fit Tolerance ISO app. 
It's free and you can play around with the different combinations to help gain some intuition behind the fit structure. So after seeing all the ways that you can tolerance things, you might be surprised to see a measurement on a drawing without a tolerance. If this is the case, it's usually implied that they're using sheet tolerance. And I could rant about the problems with sheet tolerance, but I'll restrain myself for this video. The other instances you might not see a tolerance is where the measurement is in parentheses or a rectangle. Parentheses mean that the tolerance is more of an FYI, and this is called a reference dimension, while a box or a rectangle around the dimension is called a basic dimension. I'll save the explanation of basic dimensions for the next video as it comes with a little bit of baggage, but I hope this was enough to help you start reading some more basic drawings, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.